Hey everybody, my name is John DePietro and it's a pleasure to have you join me for this edition of My Life with Kenny Rogers. Now the best part about this whole production is that you're not going to hear about My Life with Kenny Rogers. You're going to hear about the life of our special guest and the time that they spent with Mr. Kenny Rogers. And we want to tell you this right up front, that this is one of several segments that we're doing in this series. And if you want to get them all, just down in the bottom right hand corner of your screen, there's a little red button that says subscribe. So subscribe, hit that button, you'll get them all. And if there's a little bell that, that uh, is there after that, hit that bell. And then every time a new one comes out instantly, you're going to be having it sent to you, whether you're awake, whether you're asleep, but you're going to get it before the general public has a chance to go through it and pick out all the good parts. Now, we want to tell you that this is a special internet offer. It is not available in stores, so don't go to your nearest Walmart and try to get it cheaper than we're giving it to you today. So with that being said, let's welcome our guest, Mr. Garth Shaw. Hey, John. How are you, Mr. Shaw? I'm, I'm doing fine, sir. Great. So tell us um, the years that you were involved with Kenny and what your role was in the uh, juggernaut that later became um, Kenny Rogers. Well, it was kind of off and on in uh, uh, different years with the family. I, I started out working with his nephew, Dan Rogers, and that's how we met um, originally. And I was with Kenny for seven years. And then I took a couple of years off. And then I went back with Kenny as the... Uh, road manager for the opening act. I was Kenny's first ever solo career uh, road manager. Okay. And uh, at that time, uh, about a full year before Lucille changed everything, the song Lucille, obviously, um, Kenny sang, the band played, and I did everything else. You did everything else. And when I left, there was about 50, 60 people on the road two opening acts, uh, six tour buses, four semis, three hotels in every city, personal jets, uh, private limos, the whole nine yards. Basically a traveling corporation. Yes, sir. Pretty much. Now, when you said you came back with the opening act, could that be our friends by the name of Mark Miller and company? Yes, Sawyer Brown. Mm. We got to get a hold of Mark. Do you still have access to him? Um, we can, we can find out, right? Not, not to Mark directly, but some of the other fellows. Okay, good. Okay. I might be able to get a hold of uh, Hobie or, or, or Joe. Oh, perfect. Perfect. Because, uh, they played, you know, they, they were the original, uh, what original American idol people. Yeah. Star, uh, was it, uh, Star Search? Star Search. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But interesting. Um, one thing that I remember that they used to say when they were ending their segment of the show is, we want to thank Kenny Rogers for closing our show. <laughs> yeah. So, anyway, let's go back to the early years when, um, you know, before the Jets and um, et cetera, et cetera. What was it like? And I'm told that everybody, like a lot of guys in the band, all had to play two or three different instruments. and um, you know, everybody did a little bit of everything. Yeah, and, and, and yeah, in those times they certainly did. Um, obviously, except, except for Bobby, but Bobby also sang, and uh, uh, you know, uh, Gene Golden played a keyboard bass. Um, you know, Be before uh, nine months into the into the solo career, Edgar came along, and you know, as you know, he he played a whole bunch of different things, and uh, and then of course Steve and Kyle Blasmeyer and and. Uh, he uh, he played the piano and sang, and, and later he got into a, you know some rhythm guitar and the and the mandolin stuff. But he, he wasn't really doing that in the er, in the early days. So Garth, I've noticed right off in the intro introduction statements here, you're a visual guy. When you say he played the piano, the hands went like that. When he played the ah. guitar, did, yeah. Did you do the drums for Bobby? I didn't think you did a drum roll. Oh, okay. There you go. Yeah. yeah. So I can I'll tell you a, a quick funny story about that. Uh, Robert Calvin Daniels the, the third, my big brother Bobo. Um, we were playing a fair up in Washington State one time, and it was out in the grandstand, and uh, got everything set up. We had a U-Haul truck back up to this stage in front of this rodeo arena, and 
it started raining. And I had to put everything back, just pull it all back into the U-Haul truck so it wouldn't get wet. They didn't have a tarp over the stage. And so they, somebody went and found a tarp and, uh, and then we put everything back out. And in my haste, I set all of Bobby's drums up perfectly for a left-handed drummer. Now he's like, he couldn't, the foot pedal was, <laughs> it was all wrong. And man, I, I don't blame him, but he was a little ticked off. And, uh, you know, he was trying to get through the first two songs because Kenny would, in those days, do two songs before he, you know, go into a sort of an introduction monologue type thing. Yeah, yeah. And uh, <laughs> poor yeah. Bobby, he had to get through that. So you are probably filled with a lifetime full of behind the scenes stories. Give, it, give us yeah. one or two that, uh, you know, never appeared on an album jacket or a CD jacket or uh, any of the publicity stuff that the PR people would put out. Um, how, about, how about the craziest venue that you, that you may have played with, Kenny? The craziest venue? Crazy. Well, put it this way, the most memorable. Well, for me, the most memorable venue, because uh, a lot of things happened there, was the town of Las Vegas and specifically the Riviera Hotel and Casino. Uh, when Kenny first started headlining showrooms, uh, that's where it happened. And a lot of things uh, went, went on there. Uh, and at, at some point in time, back, back in the early 80s, uh, he became the biggest uh, draw in Las Vegas in, this, in that time period. And the Riviera Hotel um, decided to give him a custom-built $125,000 Stutz Bearcat automobile. And they had it lowered down onto the stage in the afternoon. And... Uh, on the stage left, and all of the uh, the musicians and the backstage dressing room entrances were on stage right. So they didn't know the car was over there. And so uh, right before the encore, when Kenny would go off and come back, they drove the car out onto the stage. And it was presented to him by uh, Wayne Newton and Pia Zadora. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, and uh, many, many, many years later, um, they used to have these shows here uh, in uh, Nashville called Tin Pan South. And it's all these songwriters playing all these venues all over town, hit songwriters. And the, the, you used to have a, a big, big thing at the Ryman Auditorium, the Mother Church of Country Music, uh, called the Legendary Songwriter Show. And some of these more major stars, would, would uh, songwriting people would come in and, and do that show. And one of those uh, was uh, Melissa Manchester. And I had some friends and uh, we saw the show and we were at the, uh, uh, the Bell South building is what it was at the time. We call it the Bat building because it looks like the ba Batman hat downtown. Yeah. And uh, they were having the after party there and Melissa was there. I hadn't seen her in all those years. And uh, my friend said, boy, I'd sure like to meet Melissa Manchester. And I said, I think I can introduce you to her. And I, and I knew if I said something, she might remember. So I walked up and I said, hi, Melissa, my name's Garth Shaw. Uh, I used to work for Kenny Rogers. And, and before I could finish the sentence, she says, did they really lower that car onto the stage? <laughs> and I introduced her to my friends and it, you know, it was pretty cool. But, so they uh, had the car hanging from the... Well, no, they, they, the roof of the stage would come off, and in the afternoon, they, they lowered it down so they could dry, actually drive it on, but they, wow. they had lowered it onto the stage in preparation. So was that prior to the Golden Nugget days or after the Golden Nugget days? Uh, after. after. Well, and then actually, after, uh, after Steve Wynn built a, a, a bigger hotel out of the Golden Nugget and had a bigger showroom. Uh, Kenny started going back there. I wasn't there then. I was I was at the Golden Nugget with him in the early days. Um, they had a little casino. Um, so you're aware of, were you there when the time when uh, Mr. Craigan came up with the idea to have all the cab drivers come in and watch a show? Oh, all of that. All yeah, of tell that. us about that. 
Well, I mean, the, 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 uh, let me say something about uh, Ken Dragon because first of all, he's kind of uh, a hero in this whole story uh, all the way through. And uh, when I was 20 years old in 1969, you know, about uh, seven years before I met Ken, uh, I moved to San Francisco and I got a job uh, promoting the play, the musical Hair. Hair. <laughs> And the San Francisco run of Hair was produced by Ken Cragen and Tommy Smothers. Ah. And so that's the first time that he and I met. And of course, he was the manager of the Smothers Brothers. And, and, and then in between that, before my time, but you know, this the, Tommy ended up becoming the, the person who discovered Kenny Rogers in the first edition. And brought them to Ken Cragen. And so, Southern California, so, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, it was, a, I forget the name of the club that they were in. I think it was in Pasadena, California. It was, a, you know, a, a popular folk club at the time. Folk music was big and, and all that. But, uh, and by the way, you know, if, if you're interested, uh, there's a number of people I'd like to hook you up with that, that you can keep continuing. Oh, absolutely. And, and I, I could probably hook you up with the entire first edition. And I, I know Keith Boogus probably could too. And, um, and a couple other folks that, that might be interesting be, behind the scenes or, uh, I don't, you do remember Roy Bickle. No, uh, was he the guy who broke his arm? Uh, don't no. I don't No, that was an angle. Okay. But Roy was our production manager when we were really got getting big. Okay. And uh, and another guy was the lighting designer and all that, Peter Morse. And Peter was actually a member of the new Christy Minstrels when Kenny was in it. Oh, interesting. And uh, so you know he goes way back. Interesting. And uh, but Roy Bickle, you'll 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 get a kick out of this because. Uh, in that 83 time when the Joe Band started promoting yep. the Kenny shows. Come on, uh, <clears throat> and Roy was putting that show together all day long. And we and he never had time to go take a shower right before they would let the audience in the arenas. Okay, and that was the so, that was the circular stage, right? Yes, sir. We had a 50-gallon drum of gambler cologne. And we would use the light rigging. And, uh, and Roy took his shirt off and he had a pair of cut off shorts and we lowered him down into this barrel of gambler cologne and then pulled him back out. And then he would uh, change his pants and put on a, a, a tour t-shirt and they opened the doors. And that was a uh, <laughs> tradition every day? What's that? It was a tradition? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but to back the truck up, uh, back to Vegas. Um, my favorite part of the, the, there was a few jokes we played on Kenny, but the thing about the, the promoting of the shows at the, at the Golden Nugget, uh, <clears throat> the, one of the cool things was when Kenny would go out into the casino and he would be there with Steve Wynn and uh, they would, the, the, the dealer would deal the cards. And, uh, and, and Wynn would see what they needed. And, uh, and he'd say, give him a, give him a two or give him, you know, and, uh, <laughs> Kenny would deal, deal the cards then. And he'd give him the card and they goes, look, he wins, pay him. And it would get out that Kenny Rogers was giving away money at card tables at the golden nugget. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> That's funny. Wow. Yeah, because that whole gold nugget thing, uh, you know, people didn't realize that it wasn't that big a venue when it started. And then, you know, to um, play in the big, big places all over. So <clears throat> talk about the days, the days just before Lucille and what type of rooms that you were dealing with. Now, for example, the Liza Minnelli story that uh, Bucky, Bucky Harris Told. They're playing in a in a showroom in uh, Tahoe. Oh, was she in the uh, the headliner? Yeah, she was in in some yeah. big room. But Kenny's playing okay. outside there, and uh, Bucky bumps into Bobby. Uh, Bobby Daniels. 
Bobby Daniels that he hadn't seen in 10 years since sure. somewhere in Huntsville, Alabama. Des describe the, um, the audience then compared to what it came, you know, right after in, well, in the early as far 80s. As that, that little lounge um, at Harris in Tahoe and Reno, but the one in Tahoe at a certain point was being renovated but it was still open. So it was like down to something like 90 people in the audience. But <clears throat> have you ever been to Disney World? Yes, sir. You know how they have all the, all the employees can go around underground? Right. The places around the park? Yep. Well, that's how Harris was built. And I don't think Bucky, because Bucky was like, well, I don't know what happened to Kenny. Well, Kenny went behind the stage and went down underground. Damn. And our dressing rooms were a block away, uh, backstage, underground, behind the main showroom. And so that's where Kenny went. So my favorite memory of that uh, was the time that Glenn Campbell was headlining in the main showroom. And of course, Glenn, before he became a big superstar in his own right, was uh, a member of the Wrecking Crew and played on a ton of hit records in the 60s. And so Kenny's doing his show in the lounge. And they would all, the shows were alternating. So with the headline show was on, the lounge was, was in between sets. Yeah. And, uh, so all of a sudden, Glenn Campbell pops up behind the lounge stage, grabs a spare guitar, and plays just dropped in to see what condition my condition was in with Kenny. And he played on the original record. Okay. So he was there, was he? he didn't walk out. What's that? Kenny knew he was there. So they said, no. no. No, he turned around and there he was. Just. Yeah. And, that, you know, I know they toured together in the last few years just before. Um, yeah. Like, you know, I, I heard that. But I wasn't aware of the, uh, I mean, there's probably several of those people that um, became well-known stars along with Kenny that Kenny bumped into. I know there was some Seinfeld stories. Oh, I've got one. You know, go ahead. Yeah. Um, yeah it, well, as you know, during the series, uh, they, they had two uh, things uh, in the scripts where it mentioned Kenny. One was a whole episode, you know, you remember where Kramer got hooked on the Rogers Roasters chicken. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but there was another one where there was a short scene in in the uh, uh, Jerry's apartment where he tells um, Elaine and George uh, that he just got back from the his rodeo engagement and he was fired by Kenny Rogers. And and that was in that was in the in the in the show. Well, <clears throat> about ten years before his show, and he was coming up as a stand-up comic. He was an opening act for Kenny Rogers. And we were playing the big venues. And at one of the uh, one of the arenas, he wasn't there to start the show. And I got a call on the two-way from the promoter, C.K. Spurlock. And he says, when Jerry gets here, fire him from the tour. And then I got a call that the limo was a, a couple blocks away. And I went out back behind the arena to wait for Kenny's arrival. And the limo pops up, and I, and there, I see Jerry sitting in the back seat with Kenny. And I walk towards the, the car, and before the limo driver can open the door for Kenny, Kenny jumps out of the back seat of the car, slams his hands down on the roof, and yells, Garth, I know what you're going to do. Don't do it. Jerry was with me. Oh. And, and Jerry was in the lobby of the hotel. It was one of those uh, places where the, the hotel was 30 minutes from the venue and he couldn't get a taxi. And when Kenny was leaving through the lobby, he saw and picked him up and brought him to the gig. Wow. Came that close to firing Jerry Seinfeld. Any other stories about uh, those kind of people? Not though, you know what I mean, about, about again, Back to the old days with another yeah. star before yeah. that other star was a rock. Well, you know, the first time Kenny actually played in a main showroom, <clears throat> excuse me, was at Harris in Tahoe as well. And he was the opening act for Steve Martin. 
And Steve was still, you know, doing stand up today. He was the wild and crazy guy. He'd come out with the suit and the tie and the banjo and the arrow in the through the head. Oh, the arrow. <laughs> well, it, as you well know, uh, throughout Kenny's entire career, he gave away tambourines on stage that he would autograph before yep. the show. And uh, nobody, nobody thought to mention this to Steve Martin. So the first night, opening night, Kenny gave away the tambourines. And then Ken, and then uh, Kenny came out, and I mean, then Steve came out, and the, the audience couldn't uh, keep the tambourines quiet, and Steve couldn't concentrate, and it just really blew him off his game. So he literally jumped off the stage, ran through the showroom, picked them all, opened these two-story tall double doors into the casino, ran through the entire casino. At the moment he was halfway in the air, jumping off the stage, he started screaming at the top of his lungs, drain the lake, drain the lake, they're playing tambourines, all the way through the casino, got in the elevator, went up to his room, called backstage, the stage manager called me over, hello, Garth, yes, uh, this is Steve Martin, yes sir. Would you please tell Mr. Rogers that as long as he's on this engagement, he will not give away tambourines for the for the remainder of his two weeks? I said, yes, sir. And that was the only time in Kenny's entire career that he didn't give the tambourines away after that for those two weeks. Steve Martin. Interesting, interesting, interesting. So um Oh, we're, we're, we're going back to, you, you do like I do. We go off on tangents when I sure. ask the question. Uh, just prior to Lucille. Back flashes. <laughs> just prior to Lucille. Uh-huh. And then Lucille hits, and then what happens? Because um, I think Edgar said that he didn't think Lucille was worthy of anything, let alone Kenny. Well, actually, I'll tell you a story about Lucille. Uh, Larry Butler found the song, Kip Kenny's producer, and uh, <clears throat> they would have these listening sessions um, and they would put songs in piles, you know, these are, you know, just throw these away, I don't like these, you know, put this in the listen again pile. And, and Kenny just kept not liking Lucille, Kenny. literally. Kenny Rogers did not like Lucille. And so this went on and this went on and this went on. and. And Larry would keep putting the Lucille back in the listen again pile when Kenny wasn't looking. And so it finally got to the point where they were in the studio and they were all done. They had 15 minutes left on the clock. And Larry said, Kenny, please record Lucille. Just give it a shot, humor me. And so he did. And Kenny always liked to sing with the, the, the 18 musicians in the studio. And so in that 15 minutes, they knocked out Lucille. And Kenny never went, would never go back in and, and re-sing his vocal and put the master vocal on the track. So the record that you heard that was the hit was Kenny's scratch vocal in those last 15 minutes of recording at one time. Is one one time on it, one time. Then after that, you went from, from lounges to what, arenas, right to arenas, or did you do theaters for a while? Um, you know, it took a little bit. I mean, yeah, in, those, in, that, in that first year before Lucille, we were doing everything from uh, county fairs to state fairs to, uh, to small showrooms to opening acts. We were the opening act for Captain and Tennille. Um, you know, that was, that was pretty funny. Yeah. They were great. Um, the, story, the story that I heard about that, you can confirm or deny. Okay. That, um, they wouldn't let you use their sound, wouldn't use their mics and, uh, wouldn't let Bobby set up. It was the lights. The lights. We were allowed to, uh, we had a spotlight and a, a, one yellow, one red and one blue would, could, and, oh, oh. um, <laughs> Well, he says, I remember doing that song in the, that show in the dark. Right. And that's why. Um, but they were, you know, they were great. I mean, I, I missed my, uh, one day on the tour, I missed my ride. And, uh, and I walked out the hotel and the limo was out there and the captain and Janine were getting in their limo. And I went over there and I went, hey, guys, can I catch a ride with you? I, mi I missed my ride to the gig. 
And I got in the back seat of the limo with the captain and Tennille. And 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 Daryl Dragon, the captain, he Darryl never Dragon. talked. He never talked to anybody. So I looked at him and I said, nice hat. Oh, he had the hat on? He had the captain hat on. Yeah. And and he went, Well, thank you, Garth. And then word got out that I was the only guy on the tour that the the captain talked to me to. It was like, whoa. <laughs> you bring up a very interesting topic because um, one of the things that I've learned in uh, being around this entertainment business for 35, 40 years is that many of the people that are the most eloquent and warm and loving on stage can be the biggest jerks when the lights are off backstage. And one of the things that everyone, without exception, has said about Kenny um, is that what you saw on stage, you saw off stage. Is that true? Well, you've all just taken the words right out of my mouth. Yes, sir. But why do you think he was like that? He, he could have been a jerk when the money started coming in. Well, you know, but that's one of the reasons, uh, you know, <clears throat> In that first year, we were supposed to go. I never got to, I was everywhere in the US with him that he ever went for those seven years, uh, you know, once a year, every year, yeah. uh, except for uh, Alaska and Hawaii. And in 76, we were supposed to go to Australia and New Zealand for the first time. And something happened and the entire tour was uh, canceled. So I had, uh, whatever that time was, I can't remember if it was three weeks or three months, <laughs> but Ken Craig had put me out as the uh, road manager for the Starland Vocal Band, Afternoon Delight, yeah. and they were opening for John Denver. So that was my training ground. I w had been with Kenny on these little venues, but John Denver was a superstar already. And he was doing those big arenas in the round. And uh, that's right. He was doing it, yeah, with a real small stage. Well, it, yeah, but it revolved and the musicians were on each corner facing in. Yeah, okay. And uh, we had a snafu one time where <clears throat> he, he had two sets of gear. So, so whatever city we were in was, you know, had been set up and we'd do that show. Another set of gear went two cities ahead. Yeah, so they'd have to already in the following so they would alternate that yeah. and somehow one of the uh, guitar players amps got on a wrong semi or something and it, it it fouled up everything so john called us up to his room and and it was kind of like he was the president of the ibm corporation and, and and for me later that's what kenny was like and he said you know we had this snafu and, we, and, and he had this whole food spread out here and he, and he just said, like, we really can't have that, you know, because these folks, they come to, to see us play and they pay a lot of their hard earned money. And so we need to try to not let that happen again. Now enjoy your meal. And he had that whole spread for us up there. Um, and that's when I, you know, I, you know, that's why they call it show business. Um, and it really is. And it really was. Mm. So same with Kenny, no, uh, no baloney, no yelling people. Because I've heard of, and I won't even mention the names, but I've heard of acts that sound check, they're absolute lunatics. And yeah. I, I've heard this one person firing people two minutes before a show. Wow. And, um, yeah, yeah, that's that's crazy. That's crazy stuff. I mean, right. I, I could have gotten in trouble a few times, but uh, I'll tell you a funny story after we started doing the bigger venues. I think this was in, uh, actually I have two, two stories about this venue. Uh, Lakeland, Florida. It was about 8,000 seats. Um, but I don't know if you remember this, back in the day they had the, you know, I could probably still, uh, like checks mix. And it was yeah. a mixture of all these things you'd see in bars to, you know, munch on. Well, I found <laughs> the guys, Gene Golden, Steve Blasmeyer, <laughs> Bobby Daniels. I'm sorry, man. <laughs> but uh, I found this dog food 
that looked just like Chex Mix. And I took it into the, the we always had a, a, a deli tray set up in the dressing room. Yeah. And I had a big bowl and I poured that whole thing of dog food in there. And uh, I threw, the, threw it under the, the tablecloth, you know, under the table. Yeah. And uh, so all the guys are in there eating it and they're just like enjoying it. And, and for some reason, uh, K- Kenny arrived early that day. And he, and he saw them all eating that and he went to get some and I went, oh no. And I had to stop in and I pulled the, the box out and I showed it to the guys and they were like, I don't think they talked to me for a week. So is the statute of limitations up on that if they uh, <laughs> tried to get you back? No, they, no. We had, we had a lot of fun like that. Now it's funny because right now as we speak, on uh, Monday morning, on August 24th, whatever it is, is that right? Yeah. Uh, the Kenny Rogers Band is in Nashville recording some Christmas stuff that they're going to uh, put out. Wow. So now, are they? No, I thought they were doing a, a live show for a club. Oh, but th- that's what it is. That's what it is. They might be doing them yeah. both at the same. That's what it is. It's yeah, a live. The Christmas show. album's done. It just hasn't been. Sh- yeah. Yep. 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 Yeah. But yeah, I wish you know I'd, I'd give a, give them a shout out here. Yeah. Um, and I'll tell, I'll tell, uh, Don Gatlin, I'm coming for you because, uh, <laughs> I want to, I want to sing with those guys sometime. Okay. Well, again, as soon as this COVID stuff ends. Yeah. I want to sing with them again. Okay. So again, now the, the, the operative word Garth on that was again. So that leads me to say as the announcer, as the MC of this thing, who, who <laughs> is listening to your every word. Well, Garth, you said again, that must mean that there was a first time. Well, there was a few times. And as you know, and have heard and have seen, uh, Kenny didn't really do sound checks. And so there was occasions like uh, when one time we were in Vegas playing at the Riv, when um, Merv Griffin came over to the old, uh, the Hilton where um, Elvis had made his comebacks, the International and yeah, Hilton. Off the strip in the back. Yeah, and, and was there for a week and, and Kenny was the, um, the guest host. So I went over there with the band and I did, uh, for, for camera blocking, uh, I walked around the stage while the band played the songs they were gonna do on the show. And I actually sang in front of them doing that. You played Kenny. I pretended to, I, I sang Kenny. I, I see and, the, I see the beard, the similarity in the beard. Ah, well, and, uh, well, the funny thing about it was afterwards, the, the, uh, the showroom Mater D came up to me and said, Oh, what's your name? You're, that was really good. Are you, you're on the thing tonight. And I said, no. And he thought I was the actual, Entertainer on the Mike Douglas, a Merv Griffin show. Crazy stuff. So then you had one more of those. One more. Um, Mike again? Douglas show. Mike Douglas show at Caesar's Palace came to take, and I took Kenny's suit over there in the afternoon, and I was going to go put it in the star dressing room backstage, and I opened the door, and the light was out, so I turned the light on, and there was this rather large man sleeping on the couch. And I went, oh, excuse me. And I turned the light back off. And this voice in the dark said, it's okay, young man. I'm not supposed to be here. And I turned the light back on and it's Orson Welles. Orson. (laughs) Crazy stuff. He had been given the star dressing room to hang out in. He had a house outside Vegas. And he was doing all of the in-house promotions on the closed circuit TV in the hotel rooms for the Caesars Palace, showing the guests uh, what was the special at the restaurant, so how to gamble at the tables and all this. And, and he decided he, he was going to go sleep in the oh, that's nice. star dressing room that day. And I had to kick him out. Talk about the guys in the band and how you dealt with them. Who were the, who were the characters and who were the ones that you had to uh, put a little more... Uh, no, I think they more had they had to they had to more like deal with me, you know. Sometimes I wasn't easy to get along with, but um, the thing of it was, you know, like I said earlier, 
you know, the whole thing, it was, it was Kenny's show. And I was hired, you know, was kind of like his right hand guy, you know, at the time. Um, and I would try to do everything I could as much as possible for everybody. But sometimes that, you know, that was a stretch. So, um, but the, the people came to see Kenny. And so, but I will tell you that when I, when I ended up leaving, um, the first time I went to visit those guys, uh, Gene Roy shadowed me for a year and, and I sort of showed him everything I was doing. Yeah. And, uh, and he, he basically took, took my place. Um, the title might've changed, but I was a road manager. Not yeah. it, Keith Bugis was called the tour coordinator at that time. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, and Roy Bickle was the uh, production manager. Um, but I was living in Las Vegas and I went over, uh, I drove 300 miles across the desert to visit them. And, and Gene had hired me under the table. So for six months after I left, I was still booking uh, all of Kenny's limos to meet him at his private jet at the airport every day <laughs> under the table. And so I, I went there uh, to the show and I saw the guys in the dressing room in, in Phoenix, Arizona. And they all gave me this giant group oh. hug and they said, we're so sorry. And I said, what are you talking about? And they said, we had no idea all the things you did for us. So that was kind of sweet. Yeah, yeah. And, so, uh, and so, it turns out it was like four or five guys divvied up. You know, Gene took the title, but four or five guys actually divvied up everything I did. And I'm like, no wonder I, <laughs> I was burned out. Basically, the band at that time was... Was Bobby Bobby Daniels on drums? Uh, Gene Golden, Steve Glassmeyer, Rick Harper, um, uh, Randy, Randy Dorman, and Chuck Jacobs. Chuck, that was the band. That was the band. Yep, that's exactly what I thought. And um, then again, Randy, Chuck, and Steve stayed right to the end, which is yeah, absolutely amazing. amazing. Now, as you look back on the showbiz stuff, doesn't that amaze you that um, two things? Number yeah. one, that Kenny can stay on top like he did for so many years. And number two, have stability. I mean, Keith is still there. Keith yeah. came prior. I mean, Keith was with the first edition. Yeah. And um, he actually left. He actually left for two years mm -hmm. from when the first edition broke up. Yeah. Um, was what happened was uh, I met a fellow named Jim Turner, who was one of the leads of the, of the uh, Jesus Christ Superstar. Okay. And they were at the Universal Amphitheater. And when they closed, I met him in some club in Los Angeles. We became roommates. And, and uh, he was being booked at Knox Berry Farm down in Orange County, a uh, big Western theme park. Yep, been there, yeah. And, and, and he had a booking agent, and the booking agent was also booking Dan Rogers County Line, which was Kenny's <laughs> nephew. Right. And Keith Bugis had become, he was a member of this band. He was a rhythm guitar player and singer with Dan Rogers. Keith played with Dan? Yes, in the Dan Rogers County line. And so uh, I met those guys there and Dan hired me and I worked with them for a year and a half all over Los Angeles and Orange County. Okay. And when the first edition broke up, Kenny had been working on his first solo album with Larry Butler in Nashville. The guys were rehearsing, but he didn't have a solo band yet. And he needed, he had one off gig at the John Wayne theater at Knott's Berry Farm. And he hired Dan and the County line. Oh, and that's where that cassette, who's, who's got that? You have that cassette? Yes. I take the first show off the board. Okay. I think Dan wants that cassette. Yeah. I'm going to get it. I'm going to have a copy of one of because I just was listening to his brand new double CD yesterday. Uh -huh. and, uh, there's some good stuff on it. Copies of that for him and Steve being on it too. Yep, yeah, exactly. But Kenny hired. Yeah. Here's uh, in Reno. Yeah. So anyway, but we want to thank you so much for taking time here. I'm getting some notes here saying that my internet connection is unstable. Well, my life has been unstable for years. 
at least now, <laughs> it's just, now it's just, they're just finding it now. But um, you know what? Um, final thoughts on your time with Kenny, and now that Kenny's not here, how how things might be uh, in your memory as to the early years. You know, now. It's still hard for me to really believe that he's gone. And uh, back about 85, I was actually doing some shows and things on my own around uh, Las Vegas when I was still living there. And I came up with this, uh, this sort of slogan or saying, and other people have sort of repeated it over the years, kind of a variation on it. But, but it, at the end of my little sets, I would say, um, and remember, when you get where you're going, you're already there. And somehow I feel like, you know, that's, that's something Kenny would have said, you know, and, uh, and, you know, and Bobby, Bobby Daniels mentioned about the, the goal thing. And, uh, and I remember how, like, you know, he said, well, you know, we're, we're doing the tonight show next week, but, you know, and uh, the first, it is a guest host. It's uh, John Davidson. But then he'd come back and he'd say in six months, I'm going to, guest host the tonight show oh that's right yep. and and he did and i was like how does he do that and, and his whole career was that way and and he had a thing you know he said one time uh you know to be on the top you know to climb a mountain he said you know, you know somebody could fly you up there in a helicopter and land you on top but his thing was the climb. It was all about how the we journey. got there. The journey more so than the and destination. The people that you meet on the way up are the same ones you're going to meet on the way back down. So be nice to everybody. Be nice to everybody. That, you know, that seems to be the case. I mean, you've had the um, opportunity to see some of the segments that we've done with others so far. Yes. And you know what? It, it seems like everybody's saying the same thing. Uh, just be nice. It's a lot easier to be nice than to be a jerk. So, anyway, Garth Shaw has the, been the man that we have been speaking with. And uh, we want to let you know, folks, that if you enjoyed this segment and want to get an opportunity to see all the others, then uh, just down the bottom right hand corner of your screen, hit that subscribe button. Then there's a bell. Hit the bell and um, you'll get them. And, you know, um, it's it's going to be a long series because everybody that we talk to says, hey, I got a couple more people that you need to talk to to make this complete. And I say, bring them on. So, Garth, let's talk after this is done. And, um, you know, you tell me who those people are. And we'll, uh, as Larry the Cable Guy said, we'll, we'll get it done. And in the meantime, folks, hey, let's go out with a blaze of glory because all good things, what, Garth? Must pass. Must end. Have a great day, everybody. Must end. Thank you, sir. Thank you.